In this video, we're going to look at the North American colonies of Britain and also of the Netherlands. These colonies, we're going to refer to them as the 13 colonies. Our learning target for this lecture is you're going to learn about the development, geography, and culture of the 13 British colonies until about the year 1700. At the end of this lecture, you need to be able to locate the territory of the 13 colonies on a map, describe its geographic features, explain Britain's goals for its colonies, describe its economy, government, and society, and also be able to describe and explain how the Dutch colonies, how they functioned, and how they came to be under the control of the British. Britain's exploration. So this is a map of explorers from Spain, France, the Dutch, and the English. Now the Spanish explorers, they got the earliest start and they explored this area that you see down here. Caribbean islands, the Gulf of Mexico, Mexico, Florida. They conquered this and claimed this area very early. Now, the French, the Spanish, and the Dutch, what they're really looking for is not necessarily land in North America. They're looking for a way around North America. They're looking for what's called a Northwest Passage to get to places like China and India. Because the Spanish controlled the South, they are going to look to the North to try and find a route around or through North America. The French are going to take a more of a northern route with the British and the Dutch focusing more on the area that we think of as the east coast of the United States today. Because of this, the area of claim by the British is going to be much smaller than either France or Spain. It's really going to be limited to the Atlantic coastal area that we see on the map here. Britain and Native American how did the British deal with the Native Americans? Really what they did was a policy of elimination. They wanted to wipe the Native Americans out by either direct warfare or by encouraging war between rival tribes of Native Americans. By 1700, the Native American presence in the British colonies is really limited to the area of the frontier with New France. To give you an example of this, we can look at the Mystic Massacre of the Pequot War of 1637. The picture that you see, this is an engraving from the time. This, the Pequot were a Native American tribe. This is a village called Mystic. There were a couple hundred men, women, and children who were living there. Colonists from Connecticut, that's this group that you see right here, they're going to surround it with their Native American out, allies on the outside. They're going to set fire to this village. And the Pequot that didn't burn alive inside the village as they try to escape the Connecticut settlers and their Native American allies killed them. So this gives you an idea of what tribal warfare was like between the British settlers and the Native Americans. The British had multiple goals in their colonization. Similar to the Spanish, they were believing in this idea of mercantilism, but their philosophy of mercantilism is a little bit different from the Spanish, whereas the Spanish just wanted to take resources. What the British want to do is grow their economy, not just the economy of the home country, but also the economy of the colonies. Their philosophy was to transport raw materials from the colonies, which were in abundance, to Britain, and then those raw materials could be manufactured into goods and then taken back to the colonies and sold back to the colonies. Their second goal was to provide a place for their surplus population. Britain was an island. It was overcrowded. It had very poor agricultural lands. They were having trouble supporting the population that they had. By encouraging movement over to these colonies, it's going to lead to rapid population growth in the colonies. So the British population in the colonies is going to grow very, very quickly in comparison with Spain or France. Finally, the British colonies it provides an outlet for dissenters. A dissenter is somebody who disagrees with the government's policy, and in the case of the British, it was their disagreement with the government's religious policies. People who practiced different religions or wanted to follow religions that were discouraged by the British government or were oppressed by the British government, they could move to the colonies and that would give them a place where they could practice their religion more freely. This also benefited the British government because now these people who are upset with their government policies, who might uh, try and rise up and overthrow the government, 
They're going to be shipped off thousands of miles across the Atlantic, and they're not really going to threaten the monarchy anymore. So it benefits both sides. The economy of the British colonies is going to develop very differently from, say, the colony in New Spain. Very little gold and silver is found. They tried. They didn't find any. It's going to force the British colonists to become very diverse and self-sufficient in their economy. And what we're going to see in the British colonies is really three different regions develop. The first economic region would be New England. That's the area that we think of today as the states of Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. This region specialized in manufacturing, lumber, fishing, and shipbuilding. Then you move into the middle colonies, the areas that we think of today as New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. While these these, this region has some of the same characteristics as New England, they're really going to focus on agricultural production, specifically food. Then you move into the southern colonies. The southern colonies are also agricultural colonies because they're going to have the best climate. They're going to focus on cash crops. You're going to see lots of plantations that rise up in Maryland, Virginia, the Carolinas, and Georgia. They're going to grow crops like tobacco and indigo and rice. Because of the agriculture in these southern colonies, they're going to rely on slave labor also because there's not enough settlers to do all the work. At first, these colonies used a lot of what were called indentured servants. An indentured servant was typically somebody of European birth, who was poor, couldn't afford to pay for their passage across the Atlantic, so they would sign an agreement to basically work as a slave for four to seven years to pay off the debt of their passage. Once their term of service was up, then they were free. Some colonies even gave them grants of land, things like that, to get them started. But not enough people agreed to take that route, so by the really by the mid-1600s, there's very few indentured servants left, and the southern colonies are relying on African slaves to meet their labor needs. This large amount of trade is going to lead to a boom in the British economy. You're going to have manufactured goods sent from Britain to the colonies, raw materials sent from the colonies to Britain. Both of them are going to send goods down to Africa. African slaves are going to ship, be shipped out of Africa over to the colonies. This is usually referred to by historians as the triangular trade. Sometimes that's a little bit of an oversimplification, but you get the idea of a triangle being Europe, Africa, and the Americas, and lots of trade going on between. And that was the British philosophy, grow the economy as a whole. Practice number one. These are true-false. I want you to put a heading in your notes. Practice number one, number one through five, and then mark the statements. You don't have to write the statements if you don't want to. Number one, relieving population problems at home was one goal of British colonization. Number two, a dissenter is someone that disagrees with a government policy enough to take action. Number three, like the French, the British considered Native Americans to be valuable trading partners. Number four, the British colonies were the largest of the three European colonial powers. Number five, the British colonies created raw materials which could be traded with the home country for manufactured goods. You need to pause that video for a minute so you can look over those and answer them. Go ahead and pause the video at this time, and you can continue. The Society of the British Colonies. Many of the settlements that are founded in the British Colonies are privately funded, and this was called the Charter System. The way the Charter System would work is a group of settlers would get a charter for the king, they would all be shareholders or owners in that colony, and then the colony's success would determine how much they would win back on their investment. Because of this, a wide variety of people are going to settle in the area. You're going to have people with lots of different types of income and lots of different trades. So it's a much more diverse economy and more balanced. You're going to have a class system that develops in the British colonies. It's going to be different from the Spanish class system that was based on the place of birth and wealth. This is a system that's going to be based on wealth and race. If somebody had a lot of money, they had more political power, more status than somebody with a little money. By the same token, if your skin was white, you were going to have more political power than somebody whose skin was black.
There are many religions that are represented in these colonies, but these people with the different religions, they don't always get along. In fact, at some points, wars break out between these different religious groups. What happens is people of similar beliefs tended to settle in specific regions. Puritans, that's one religious group, they settled in New England. Catholics settled in Maryland, another religious group. They were referred to as the Quakers. They settled in Pennsylvania. The government of the British colonies. The British exercise a very low level of central control over their colonies. And historians have called this the policy of salutary neglect. And it's basically where the British government kind of lets the colonies do whatever they want, run their own show. The British are very lax in their enforcement of rules and taxation. There's minimum investment by the crown. They don't have to hire soldiers. They don't have to hire tax collectors. They don't have to hire judges. The colonists take care of all that on their own. So the British don't really have to spend any money on their colonies, which they kind of like. Three types of colonies are going to develop. The first are charter colonies. These are colonies set up by a group of investors. Because they're set up by groups of investors who end up living in the colony, typically, they tended to practice self-government by the landowners who lived there. And what you see in the picture is a reenactment of the Virginia House of Burgesses. That is the first representative government in North America. It was set up in Virginia in the early 1600s. But to participate in that, you had to own land. Then you have proprietary colonies. A proprietary colony was a colony that was controlled by either one individual or a small group. Pennsylvania is an example of this. Pennsylvania... The proprietor was a guy named William Penn, he was somebody who actually the king of Britain had owned, owed a lot of money to, and in order to kind of pay off his debt, he gave the Penn family the colony of Pennsylvania. Sometimes these kind of colonies also used self-government. And then finally you have royal colonies. These are colonies that were controlled by the British crown. Sometimes charter colonies or proprietary colonies that were failing or weren't working out were taken over by the crown, and then they were run as royal colonies. We need to look at the influence of the Netherlands in this area. Often we'll call, describe them as the Dutch. They set up a colony called New Netherlands. They explored and claimed the area of New York and New Jersey. The Dutch allowed their colony to be controlled by a business called the Dutch East India Company. So this is a colony that was motivated almost entirely by profit. They were similar to the French in that they traded for furs with the Native Americans. The Dutch tended to encourage settlement by all kinds of people from all kinds of different countries. It's going to lead to this area being very diverse. It's going to grow very quickly. Lots of different religions and countries represented. The other big business in New Amsterdam, which was the capital of the colony, was the slave trade. And New Amsterdam was really the commercial center of the Atlantic slave trade. Because the Dutch government didn't really supervise or protect this colony, it's going to lead to its capture very easily by the British in 1664, and then it's going to get absorbed into the British colonies. But a lot of the influence in the economy that developed under the Dutch, that's going to continue when it's a British colony. All right, put a heading in your notes, practice number two, one through five. You're going to mark these true or false. Number one, unlike the French and Spanish colonies, the British colonies had no social class system. Number two, people of similar religious beliefs tended to settle in specific parts of the British colonies. Number three, some British colonies practiced self-government, Number four, Dutch colonies in America encouraged settlement by people of different religions and countries. Number five, Dutch failure to protect New Netherlands led to its loss to the British. If you need to, you can pause the video so you can watch that. That's going to conclude our lecture on the North American colonies of the British.